Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my shop. So I've been in this shop now for oh, like almost two years and I haven't really been like that good about getting things set up and getting things organized yet. So I am checking one thing off the list, sort of. This time we're gonna actually remake a project that I made many, many years ago before I was making videos. We're going to make a nicer version of this uh, sandpaper storage cabinet. This thing, uh, it stores full sheets of sandpaper, the, the full, whatever, full size sheets. And then it also has a spot over here for five inch sanding discs. So this thing predates a couple of things. First off, it predates the fact that I used a five inch sander, which I haven't used a five inch sander for like almost 10 years now, since I went to a six inch sander. And of course, one of the other problems with this is that I designed this little like sanding pad area for back when I bought sanding discs by like a three or five pack. Now I buy them by a hundred pack. So I don't actually need the little like the sandpaper disc storage area over here. Uh, so I think I can reuse, re, re-engineer this little cubby to be something a little more useful for uh, today's sort of standards. So back in the old shop, this cabinet used to be hanging over here on this wall right here next to the, uh, the hand tool rack thing. And now in this shop, I have this little space here between the garage doors, which in the old shop, this would have been where the dust collector would have been. So I want to put my sandpaper storage thing right here. I still utilize the full sheets the most here at the bench for hand sanding. So having the nice, uh, a nice proximity to the bench will be kind of nice as well. I'm thinking maybe instead of having the top section just be a giant crap catcher, you could have maybe some storage for like a router or something nearby the bench. So I want to make the top section a little bigger. I'm going to make the bottom section the same size and I'll end up having something else going on over there. So let's take a look at some wood because uh, if we're gonna make something, we might as well make it out of something nice, I guess. <laughs> so like most of the other shop projects, shop storage stuff in the shop, it's all made of elm. So this is a chunk of elm that uh, was one of the very first things I cut on the sawmill. So we're gonna do a little flashback here and I'll, I'll show you cutting this thing out of the log. Morning, I am out picking up logs at a orchard slash vineyard. There's one of the stumps. Some smaller stuff. Getting pretty full. Just gonna grab one more. Grab this guy right here. All right, here we go. Hope you guys survive this. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad at all.
and the Elma cut yesterday, the longer stuff is back here. Got some really awesome crotch figure up there, and it's just a little bit down there, but for the most part, I'm really interested in what's going on up there. I think it's really cool. So this piece has this nice piece of uh, crotch figure down here, and I'm hoping, and I'm thinking at least, that I can get the entire project out of just, just, just this one board, and I will, I think I'm gonna incorporate the crotch section down here to be the side that faces the bench over here. So as we're looking this way, we have some kind of cool crotch thing. And I'm thinking that this will be the back edge of the cabinet. This will be the front edge of it. So I think what we're gonna have to do is we'll have some epoxy filling to do. And I'm gonna do that first before I actually get into cutting this thing down a little bit. You have a couple options with the epoxy fills. You can do them now or you can do them later. The, um, the one nice thing with doing it now is that once you mill this thing and get it surfaced and everything, the epoxy is all milled off and surfaced exactly flush and flat and everything. And it just kind of saves you the hassle of trying to apply epoxy to like a surface piece already. And you don't have to really worry about uh, bleeding nearly as much. So let's take a quick look here. If we flip this thing over, we have some other little defects here as well. One of the kind of cooler things with the history of this piece is down in here, there's actually an ant colony right in here. So this is the remnants of an ant colony. It had carpenter ants added in it at one point. Actually, it was there when I sawed it. This actually has an ant uh, colony in it. Um, just this board, the next board off the log, this one here is totally clean. There's no uh, caves or caverns or whatever tunnels in this one, but there are in here. So if I dig into here a little more, you can see here is their actual, um, I don't know what we want to call that, cave, cavern, home, <laughs> colony, area. So I think I'd also like to fill this with, uh, with epoxy as well, and we'll use this edge side here as our reference edge, which would be the, uh, the back side of the whole case. So, to make this a little bit easier, make things stick a little bit better, I'm going to give the area that I'm going to be masking against a quick sanding. That's going to make the tape adhere and stick and seal a little better. And then we can get into doing the actual fill. So you can see this one has this really nice bar conclusion here and we got these kind of pieces that look like they can uh, pretty easily break off. So one of the sort of side benefits of doing the epoxy fill first is I can fully preserve all of this and not have to worry about damaging it through the milling process. If I were to mill this now, this would get destroyed by the jointer or planer and you wouldn't end up with something nearly as crisp and clean as we're gonna get here with our epoxy fill. So for these fills now, we're gonna use Total Boat's traditional five to one Epoxy, this is gonna be a really nice epoxy for this. It's going to be a slow hardener. So the advantage to that is it's gonna give it plenty of time to flow down and find all of its little defects and cracks and get into all the nooks and crannies before the epoxy starts to solidify. Ugh. That just ensures that we get a really nice, solid, like full coverage kind of thing. And to color it, I'm gonna use Transtint Medium Brown. I like this one a lot. We've talked about this a lot in the past. This gives it sort of a shadowy kind of look to it. It allows the epoxy to still preserve the depth in the wood. 
so it looks like a crack or a defect. It doesn't really accentuate it. It just makes it look like a shadow line, essentially. So although that looks like kind of blackish on camera. It's actually a, uh, it's kind of brown. It's like a dark brown. So let's flip this guy over and see what we got to deal with. So we have these giant ant caverns in here where the actual nest was. And we have the bark inclusion down here in this uh, kind of crotch area. So this is probably gonna take a pretty good amount of epoxy, actually probably more than I mixed up here. And then we have some checking and cracking throughout the whole thing here in the middle, which we should uh, also be able to fill in while we're at it. So I'm gonna start pouring some stuff in here and we'll let it kind of flow down here and fill up from the bottom. It's kind of the one thing about filling these kind of voids and things is it's very easy to get trapped air. So ideally you're pouring this stuff down, it's hitting the bottom of the void and filling from the bottom up, pushing the air out. If you just slather epoxy over the entire crack on the whole top, there's nowhere for the air to escape. So the epoxy is gonna push air down into the cavity, create air bubbles, and you're gonna have voids in the epoxy, which isn't really a big deal structurally, but in this case, we're planing. So if we hit any air bubbles as we get deeper into the material, that's just more touch of filling that I would have to do. So technique at this stage can save you a bit of time later on in the future. And with something like this too, we have a lot of filling we're doing. I don't really expect this to be like a one fill operation. I'm gonna guess this will take a few applications, but my main concern right now is just to get this thing to a point where it's stable enough to start doing some thicknessing and some surfacing, get these things into flat, get them into actual furniture parts, and then I can worry about doing any sort of touch-up fills anymore cosmetic fills from there. But at least I have a head start on a lot of filling from here. So there we go, all of the defects are filled at least to some extent. And we'll take a look at this in the morning. So the epoxy has set up overnight and next I want to just do a little bit of layout here, start doing our rough breakdown and getting this slab thing cut up into the individual parts. So the original design here is 18 wide and 20 tall and the width is really just dictated by the size of the sandpaper. Since I'm making this cubby for something else unknown <laughs> at this point, adding the width on there is going to make this cubby wider, make it more useful for some other stuff. And the biggest thing is on my new wall area here, I have a little over 20 inches between the rails. So I'm going to go to a 20 inch wide case. And I have some more height now, so I'm gonna go to 24 for the overall height, which to give me some space up here for that router or whatever other thing I wanna put on that top cabinet area. So I'm gonna do sequential layout down here. And the biggest thing for me is the section of crotch with the bar conclusion and things. So conveniently, starting at the bottom of the crotch, the top is 24 inches. So that's gonna be my side. And I'll have the bottom, the other side, and the top sequentially down that way. One thing I wanna look at here though, as I'm looking at breaking down my parts, as I get into this section here with the crotch and that crazy bark inclusion, this is where a lot of the distortion happened in the slab. So when I do my breakdown, what I wanna do is actually cut this piece off and process it individually because it is causing a lot of distortion that's gonna be transferred and translated down the board. So we'll have the side right here at about 24. And then the top or bottom, whichever way this is going to go, is going to be right around here. And we'll have uh, another side, 24, right there. And then we'll have bottom or top, whichever way this is going to go again, down to right around there. That's going to leave me with about a foot down here, so I'm not going to be able to get my shelf piece, but I'll be able to get this vertical partition here out of this board. So I need something else for here. I grabbed this piece of cherry. I grabbed this piece of cherry because I figured this would happen. So we have a nice piece of cherry. That should make for some fun contrast for our shelf piece. So we'll have a chunk of that, which will become this guy here. So I'm gonna start breaking this thing down into some more manageable pieces and do a, uh, a rough milling. We're just gonna remove a little material from both sides 
get things cleaned up and then we'll let these rest for a few days to allow them to distort or do whatever it is they're gonna do. So at least they've been resting and acclimating for a few days. So we can take a look and see if they're still flat. I would say that it hasn't moved at all. It actually has that suction feeling as I'm trying to lift off the table. So I think from here, we can actually skip the jointer. We can take this down to final thickness and then we can start actually cutting our parts out of this thing to start making the case. So I'm gonna need two sides, a top and a bottom. And then I'll see you at the bench and we'll uh, do some dovetails. So I've already gone through and laid all my parts so I have everything labeled and oriented the way that I want them to be. I like to make sure I mark and label the front edge and I mark the uh, outside face except for the bottom which I mark the inside face because it's like the side facing up. It doesn't matter how you mark things as long as you're consistent about it and you remember what you did. So this is going to be a through mire dovetail just like the the hand tool cabinet and the router bit cabinet just kind of keeping with the same theme so we'll have a through dovetail connection of the corners and the bottom corner will be mitered so we'll have to kind of keep that in mind as we're working that's the one thing i don't want to cut on the bandsaw because that's where i'll cut these is on the bandsaw so i'm just gonna make a little mark here to make sure that i don't get my bandsaw blade anywhere near this front corner because we have to cut that here at the bench by hand Okay, otherwise layout's gonna be exactly the same as uh, the other projects. We got our pin and tail length, which are equal because both parts are the same thickness. So I'm gonna go around and start scribing all of these. Since this is a hanging cabinet, the case sides will be the tails and then the top and bottom will be the pins. And I'm gonna start tails first on this. So I'll start with the sides and get the tails cut on those first. Okay, going for asymmetrical tails this week or this time or whatever.
So next we can take care of the miter section here at the front. So that is gonna be with the layout towards the inside. So I'm gonna lay out a tail on this side, which look at that, I already did. <laughs> Make it a little more concrete. So now I can take a handsaw and essentially connect the baseline or the scribe line back here to the very, very edge of the board right there. Something like that. Now I have to cut this little ear part of the miter off. I'm just gonna lay out a quick guideline. I'll handsaw this to move the bulk of the waste, and then I'll come back and we'll pair it with a chisel and a little guide block. This is the inside, right? Yes. <laughs> That always scares me every time I do this. Make sure you're cutting from the inside or your miter's gonna be facing the wrong way. Okay, we're right back to the scribe line down here. That's where our miter starts. This one's good. One of the things I've talked about in the past is you can modify the fit of your, uh, your pins by moving your tailboard in or out. So what I do is actually move the tailboard so it's actually not flush. So this would be flush. I come past it a little bit by whatever that is, the sound of that. <laughs> A fingernail width past the edge there and that gives me a little bit tighter fit um, or at least a more consistently uniform fit so you can play with that if you're having problems getting the fit to be like nice off the line if it's too loose and consistently too loose just scoot the board this way a little bit and that'll tighten things up for you um, of course the process you use to actually cut these pins will Kind of vary that a little bit, but I don't know if I come past here a little bit, typically these will fit right off the uh, right off the scribe line, right off this knife line, and won't be too small, which is a worse problem to have, arguably. Now this one's a little bit goofy because you got this miter situation here, so I'm just going to get as much as I can. I have most of the line there. And then because it's straight, I can just take a bigger chisel, like this huge one, and just extend the line a little bit.
Okay, so now I'm gonna take this over to the table saw and I'll make some cuts over there to remove the waste. Removing waste isn't glamorous, so I actually find that using a table saw and raking the piece across the blade ends up with a really nice quick and clean result. A little bit of uh, detail here, if you do raise the blade all the way to the scribe line and you rake back and forth right at that line, you will end up with a little bit of a kind of proud surface in the middle there. So when your dovetail goes to fully seat, you will have a hairline gap in there. If I'm doing it at the back of the drawer, for instance, I don't care. And I'll just use it right off the saw right to the scribe line. But because this is actually like a piece of joinery that you're going to see, I'm going to stay back from the scribe line a little bit. And that'll give us a little material to chop. And it'll actually allow me to undercut this connection so I don't have anything getting in the way of the tail fully seating in that pin socket. So depending on how many passes you do too will determine how bumpy this is. But just to give you an idea here, this one is a pretty rough one. So we have a nice hump there in the middle. You can kind of see that. This one's somewhere in the, the middle range of things. So that one's kind of flatter, but still a hump in the middle. And this one is kind of worse, I think. It's got a little, little hump they do there. <laughs> But you can see I left just enough to leave me with my scribe line still on here. And I can do my final chopping and I can undercut this just like I would if I was doing a waste removal in an, any other kind of way. So that just leaves me with all the, the fine tuned finesse stuff that I actually enjoy here at the bench. All that waste is mostly gone. And out of my way. I can do the part that I actually enjoy. Which is the chisel work. All right, so just a little bit of chopping here. Again, I got, I left myself just enough for my final chop. A little bit of undercut here, make sure that middle doesn't keep that tail from seating all the way in there. Okay. Actually, what's kind of cool about this tree is how it grew. Like, look how fast it grew early on in its life. That's one growth ring right there. That's, that's a lot of growth <laughs> for one season. And then it kind of slowed down to something a little more normal over here. But look how, look how that, that's a lot of growth in one, one year. So we'll see how that uh, that likes chisels. <laughs> I think you're going to see the density change as you work across the board here. Let's give this one a go. I don't have a whole lot of faith that this is going to perform nicely. It's not happy. It's like rolling up behind my chisel, pushing it forward. So I have to like drift the chisel back <laughs> into the cut. Yeah, see it's bouncing, I'm bouncing out of the cut. So on this one, I'm like intentionally angling the chisel based on what I learned over there from the beginning. And that's helping. That one actually dove and undercut quite a bit, which is fine. Oof. That one was not happy. <laughs> yeah, it's just gone. Not that we needed it there, which is good, but it's gonna happen too. That one pushed out. 
So you can see right here, as the chisel started down, these fibers actually collapsed and folded down and found their way behind the back of the chisel, causing the chisel to twist and rotate as I was chopping down. Not a huge deal, because I'm still on the scribe line over here, but I'm basically at this kind of weird angle now that I have to have the chisel drift to kind of clean up. So let's see, I'm gonna try and get in there and get a bite. Then I can kind of come back. Yeah, it's like, you know, dovetailing a marshmallow. <laughs> Although I think that'd be actually easier than this. So that gets rid of all the chopping waste. A little more here, actually. There we go. Now it takes care of all the chopping waste. So now I can work on the final fit of the pins. I have a little extra material there because I don't saw right to the line because I know I'm not that good. So it's a little bit there. So let's set this thing up in the vise and we'll do a little pairing to get these all to the right size. So I have a scrap backer here to keep me from blowing out the back side of the pin as I'm coming across. And we'll go into the vise here. Okay, so if we're doing like a regular dovetail joint, at this point we could do a test fit, but we're not. We're doing a miter dovetail, so we need to miter our pin. And because this part's terrifying, I want to double check. Um, this is the front. Okay. This way. <laughs> it would be a bad day. If you cut this miter in the wrong direction, don't do that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Now for some more pairing. So I have this little guide block thing that is like a miter pairing block. It's made specifically for this operation. I can put it on here and it actually gives me the whole reference around the corner. So eventually I want to be right on that scribe line, but I'll probably start a little forward of that and we can kind of pair and go. Before I get going, I'm going to give my chisel a quick rub on my horse's butt. Okay, let's see what kind of sounds you make. <laughs> this is not a noise, it's a sound. Okay. Okay, uh, top, top, top. Yes, that's the top. This is the side. Okay, it goes together at least. Not necessarily the best work I've ever done, but not the worst either. I got, I think I got a little bit of junk down in here somewhere because it's not seating fully, which is causing my miter to stay open a little bit. So we might have a little bit of 
I might have a little cleanup work to do in there, but otherwise that's the process of getting that miter, that miter through dovetail on there or in there or whatever. <laughs> I got some mineral spirits here so I can see the dovetail joints a little nicer on camera. Oh, there we go. That's what the uh, through miter dovetail joint looks like. Now that joinery is all cut, I want to get into getting the divider pieces in here. And before I can do that, the one thing that actually sets all those dimensions is all the slots in here for those sandpaper holders. So next I want to cut all those slots so I know where the top of that area is going to be. So I know where the bottom of the middle divider is going to be. And we can kind of go from there. So I have my divider stock here for this vertical divider which I have the same exact saw patterns as the uh, case side. And I have the top left long so I can trim it the final length once I know where those dados are going to stop. So I'm going to make some lines on here so I know that's the side I'm supposed to cut dados on. Each sandpaper compartment is a half inch. The dividers for the shelves are essentially what the, sh the shelf material is eighth inch MDF. So I need to find my first position for that very bottom, which is going to be the thickness of the case bottom, the half inch for the sandpaper, and then that should be the start of the dado for that first shelf. And then for every subsequent shelf, I have to move the fence over by five eighths of an inch and make a pass and keep on going all the way through. These are through dados so that the shell pieces can be slid in from the front while the case is still mounted on the wall. Now we get into the dividers. So I took that piece of cherry. This is that middle divider. It's cut to exactly the same size as the top and bottom because this piece is going to go through the sides. Yeah, we're going to do some through tenants because I'm feeling a little, a little wild and crazy. Normally I don't bother with the through tenon, but I'm thinking that might be a fun little uh, accent on this piece. So I'm going to lay out the tenons first because uh, that's the biggest thing with through tenons is the layout's got to be like perfect because uh, there's really no hiding any flaws or mistakes. So I'm going to at least set my layout here and then we'll transfer the layout to the inside and outside of the case sides and have a layout here. So it's all. So for the layout, I decide I want my tenons to start an inch in from the front and back edge. So those are those lines right there. I want to have, let's say, three tenons in here somewhere. So I'm going to divide up the space in between here and set our spacing based off of that. So I have a divider that's already set for this distance here. And I get questions sometimes about how to set dividers. So how do I set them perfectly to go from here to here? Uh, it's literally trial and error. So they're going to be too small or too big or whatever. So you just walk it out. Don't push too hard. Oh, it's too short. So I need to make it wider and just that process repeated until you get it actually divided up uh, how it needs to be. So that is the spot and that's the spot right there. So that is going to be the center of the, uh, the tenonless material. 
So I want to know like, how far apart my antennas I want them to be. I'm going to keep them the same spacing. So I need to come over a half inch from either side of this line and that will be our bit of layout. So this is the area in between those tens there. This is the area between this tenon here. So this is on this board, at least that's waste. That's waste. That's waste. And that's waste. So that's going to leave me with a symmetrical layout. I have inch and three quarter in the middle, inch and a quarter, and then inch and three quarter. So kind of matching what's going on. Maybe other places a little bit symmetrical yet asymmetrical because the tens are different widths. On the side pieces, I laid out the location of the, um, the dado here where that piece is going to go. So I have that laid out starting the stop point of the little thin dado or the little stub tenon, which is going to be on the base of the piece so that the divider is fully housed. We have a shoulder there to cover up all of the internals. So this is a half inch wide. Our work piece is three quarter. And uh, now I'm going to start transferring the start and stop points of all those tenons to the inside. So I know where to start and stop my cuts with the router and then to the outside. So I know where to actually do all my chopping and all of that when I go back to clean up and score up all the pieces. So it's kind of a lot of layout. So I'm going to get my marking gauge set for every position, mark all four areas on the two boards, and then we can start setting up the router. Okay, so here's the setup. I have the whole case assembled. I'm using it as a reference here. And I have this little fence guide thing down here, which is gonna offset my router and get it exactly where it needs to be uh, top to bottom. We're kind of sideways right now. So this can go and be flipped onto the other side and we can make sure that these tenons and this dado end up exactly the same distance from the bottom so that that divider ends up nice and parallel the, uh, the whole way across the case. So I'll come in and I'll route my little stub tenon area through here, which is gonna give me a little eighth inch stub on the bottom there. That'll go fully into there. And then these areas here will be for the tenons and those ones will plunge all the way through the case. So you can see I have a piece of MDF here on the underside. I have uh, four clamps here pressing the side down into the MDF. So I don't have any blowout or tear out on the, uh, the outside face, the show face, which is down. So. Hopefully this will allow me to get a really nice clean cut. And I'll have very minimal cleanup work to do afterwards with my chisels. Oh, I can see through it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, so cuts on the outside are pretty darn clean. I'm a little shy of the lines, so I can either just chisel all out of the way or I can just make note, flip it over and run it again. I'm gonna make a few touch-ups here and then I'll flip it over and do the same thing to the other side.
Okay, so that went pretty smoothly. I did switch my technique a little bit on the second one. Instead of um, cutting the dado first and then plunging all the mortises, I cut the mortises first and then came back and plunged the, um, the mortises. No, I came back and cut the dado. I cut the dado second. That allows me to be able to see my uh, scribe lines a little bit easier than approximating where they were when I was uh, plunging the mortises after the dado. So I was able to get a little closer to my lines right off the bat, so to speak. So I got a little guide board here so I can make sure I'm chiseling down straight as I score up these, uh, or as I score up, as I square up these uh, inside corners so I don't have these ugly rounded tenons. <laughs> One thing that I will uh, I will share or note or whatever, I used a half inch bit to cut this half inch mortise and using it with just a reference edge like that, it does give a little bit of chatter on the side opposite of the, the fence thing. So my cuts aren't actually perfect up in here. It's a little bit jagged and there's a little bit of walking here and there. So my edge of my mortise isn't perfectly crisp or it's not quite as clean as it could be. So a better way to do this would be to use a bit smaller than the size you want and set up a second fence or some kind of jig or a guide bushing type of jig so that you're cutting both the walls in separate passes. Uh, that will make it a little bit cleaner and a little bit nicer looking. And a smaller bit should get you a smaller rounded inside corner, less cleanup as well. I'm, uh, I'm making a shop project, so I don't really care that much how crispy clean the edge of my mortise is. So I'm gonna start cleaning things up. I'm gonna be cutting here uh, cross grain first, severing fibers and getting all of this cross grain end grain cuts out of the way. The fence here is more just to keep my line straight as I come in across. As I'm going down into the mortise, it doesn't matter what my chisel does either way because we don't have a visible surface on the inside and we have a little bit of a, uh, a lip on there. We're gonna have an eighth of an inch of um, shoulder on the, uh, the shelf coming through there. So if you blow out the inside, you have an eighth of an inch of clearance, or I have an eighth of an inch of clearance that's gonna get covered up if I have some garbled up mess of stuff in there. On this back side, I'm just kind of getting close to the line at this point. I and we'll come back and move the fence and do a final chop. I want to get back far enough that I can do my uh, sidewall uh, chops here. And of course, another thing we could do is if your cuts are really wavy, you can always adjust them by moving this fence further away from the cut line and making your mortise is a little wider and at this point you know we haven't cut the tenons yet so if i wanted to make this more perfect i could shift the fence and use my chisel to establish the new walls of the mortise but i don't care So I'm going across here and just making sure that the scribe lines that I scribed onto this piece and this piece are actually what ended up happening in reality. And I didn't end up like shifting one of these lines left to right a little bit. So it looks like everything is lining up pretty nicely, but I'm still going to stay away from this line just a tiny hair and I'll fine tune the fit here at the bench.
That's pretty cool. Let's see if that's... It's gonna go right here, so let's see how it looks. It looks like a, like a thing on the wall. I kind of didn't think about this. <laughs> the, the garage rail completely blocks all the crotch. Oh well. <laughs> so that is the, uh, the shelf with the through tenons. Uh, we gotta do this one next. And this will be the last little bit of joinery on here. So now that we have this thing fully assembled, now we know the actual final height of this piece. Yay. Okay, I got one of my little shelf pieces here so I can get this thing lined up and get this marked out so I cut this into roughly the right place so my shelf pieces will fit. And uh, this is, of course, this is set up to do a through tenon just like this piece is, but I don't think I'm going to do that because I'm feeling kind of lazy. So I'm actually going to do this, a, I guess my normal way of doing a uh, tenon thing, a normal crenellated tenon, non-through tenon. And the biggest thing here is just my shoulder length is consistent. And again, I have my marking gauge set to the thickness of my pieces. Everything's still the same. So I can make my shoulders and then cut my tens down to a shorter length. The biggest difference this time uh, for the technique that I'm doing is I like to cut the tenons first before then cut the mortises because I can use the tenons themselves to lay out the mortises. Slightly sexier. So there it is, all dry assembled, and man, I'm pretty excited. That looks pretty darn awesome, and it's going to be quite a lot nicer than the uh, than the old one. So I'm going to go ahead and take this thing apart for the last time and finish sand all the interior surfaces, and then we can get this thing all glued up and closer to being done. All right, so time for glue up. I am using Total Builds traditional. Five to one's the same uh, epoxy that we use to fill all of the voids and cracks and defects in there. So it is nice that this thing can do, you know, more than one thing or task in the shop. So there's two kind of advantages to using epoxy here for the glue up. First up, as always, is just the open time. This will give me about 45 minutes of working time to get this project assembled with this many things that have to kind of fit together in a certain order. That's gonna be, quite handy and a lot less stressful than using a PVA that would be like, I don't know, 15 minutes and you're done. <laughs> With this stuff, you know, 45 minutes, you can still tweak things. If you need to, you can still pull things apart. You know, you got a lot of time. It's a lot more of a um, peaceful and relaxed glue up than this crazy mad rush to get everything slammed together, get it all fully seated, get it all squared up and just make sure it's all perfect and everything. The other fantastic thing here is because we have so much joinery sliding together, this stuff will act more like a lubricant and it won't actually swell the fibers because it's not water-based. So all of these things that were pretty tight before, they will slide together a lot easier than it has been because uh, this will act more like a lube than an adhesive, at least until it's, you know starts setting up. 
So this will take about uh, 18 to 24 hours to fully cure. So that's the total time of the clamps. So that's the only, I guess, downside to this is if you're in a rush, this is not probably the best way to go. But, you know, we have a fair amount of time invested in joinery at this time, or at this point. And uh, it's not a big deal. I can throw stuff in the clamps today and I'll be ready to go sometime tomorrow. So there it is in the clamps. That took about uh, 20, 25 minutes or so to get to that point at a nice leisurely pace. One nice thing about this sort of joinery is it's fairly self-squaring. So um, yeah, I'm dead on, haven't touched anything as far as racking it or anything. So it's uh, perfect the way it is. And uh, I'm just gonna clean up any little bit of squeeze out that I see with some acetone and then uh, let this one sit until tomorrow. Okay, it's so the next day. The epoxy has cured and this thing is ready to come out of the clamps. So I'm gonna pull out the clamps, give it a final sanding and then I'll see you for some finishing. Okay, to the magic of uh, time travel or whatever, there is it all sanded and ready to go. And we'll get a coat of finish on here and start seeing some of this wood uh, come together or come, come alive. It's already together. Let's get it to come alive, shall we? So I'm gonna use a few coats of wiping varnish, kinda as, as always, and we're gonna start with the bottom so I can apply the finish with it uh, kinda upright. So I want to just kinda mention this little thing that we haven't really talked about yet, which I normally talk about with shop projects. And the shop projects give you, I guess, a few opportunities, or there's a couple of different ways you can go about doing uh, shop projects or how you kind of put them together. So first off, you can just do it as a purely utilitarian thing since it is a utilitarian thing. It's designed to do some utilitarian thing in the shop, store your stuff, you know, or whatever. The other thing you can use a shop project as is a great way to practice maybe a new or different technique because this is a fairly low stakes environment to actually practice and try these things out. So if you haven't done, you know, through tens before, this would be a good chance to try those out, see what the sort of, um, you know, problem points might be, a little more sticking points, challenging points of it, figure out what's gonna actually work for you and a technique that actually works for the way that you work in a fairly low risk environment. If these don't end up perfect, doesn't really matter because it's a utilitarian thing. And now I guess for the, the third kind of thing, you know, I spend a lot of time in here. Why can't I have nice furniture in the shop too? Just like I do in the house. <laughs> so that's the, uh, I guess the, the more fun way to look at it, if you will. One thing I didn't mention this time, which I have mentioned in the past, is that one of the nice things about using epoxy for glue up is if you're going to use a clear finish like I am here, epoxy is technically a clear finish. So if you do have any squeeze out or ghosting or hazing from the epoxy going on, when you apply your actual first coat of finish, it all kind of blends together and you'll never know that there was, you know, some squeeze out or some staining from that epoxy. So it's kind of a nice bonus because you can be a little more sloppy and a little more, you know, free <laughs> with your epoxy application because it has no consequence or very little. The only thing I concern myself with is any kind of bigger globs that I would then have to like sand or chisel away to get rid of. But otherwise, if I can wipe it away it's not a concern of mine in the slightest. All right, there's that first coat of finish. This thing is looking pretty awesome. I love, look at this, look at that figure over there. Eh, so good. Yeah, I'm gonna let this sit for a bit and then I'll give this thing a few more coats over the next few days. So a few coats of finish and some decals later. There is the, uh, the piece ready to go up on the wall. I made a quick cleat out of the uh, white oak offcut from the flooring. So that's my 
cleat piece which will go in the cabinet this piece will go on the wall we got some more crotch so it's gonna look uh, pretty darn nice so I'm gonna finish getting this thing together get all my sandpaper in there and all that and we are done with improving the shop some more So there is the new bench side sandpaper holder organizer shelf thing with bobber. I got a router and my tape dispenser in there so far. And you know, maybe I'll put something else kind of right there, but it's really nice looking sitting there on the wall and it looks and functions a lot better than the, uh, the old one, which is uh, right there. A real nice, quick, functional shop project. Great to get out here and do a little woodworking, do a little practice, and uh, use that elm that I've had for uh, a long time now. Looks, uh, it looks good. It's, uh, it's nice. <laughs> so that's gonna do it for this one. Thank you, as always, for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on the sandpaper shelf holder cabinet wall mounted thing with Bobber, please feel free to leave a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking.